Okay, we're starting. Let's go over the quiz quickly to, uh, to review going over determinants. This is quiz five. One. Compute. <laughs> How do you expand this? Use the zero. Column with the zero. Pretty much any one that has the zero. So you can use the first column or the second, uh, the second column or the first row. Probably use the first row because I get to multiply by one. So let's let's set that up. Um, but if you went down the second column, you would get the same answer. But choosing something with including that zero would be a good idea. Um, so remember there's a plus sign here, a minus sign here, a plus sign here. So it's plus one times, block out everything in that row and that column, you end up with one, two, two, minus two. The zero you ignore, and then it's plus one for this guy. Block out everything in that column and, and that row. So I get two, one, minus one, two. So that would be written on this line here. And then finally, on the last spot, you do the two by two determinant. So this time this minus two minus that plus this time this is four minus that times that would be minus one. So that becomes a plus one. So this minus this and minus two minus one, so it's minus one was the answer. User answer in problem one and Kramer's rule solve for z in the following system. So I gave you x plus z equals zero, two x plus y plus two z equals four, minus x plus two y minus two z equals nine. And the idea it was to realize that the coefficient matrix of this is actually that. Um, so I do. So you already do know what d is. It's minus one which Kramer's rule tells you, you will have a unique solution. So the next thing you need to find, to find the z is to find dz. And then I put the space for you to do that. And how do we find dz? What is that? You would replace the z uh, column with the 049. Right, so you'd replace the z column. So this would be like x column, the y column, the z column. Replace the z column with the constant matrix. So you're pretty much going to copy down the first two columns of this guy and then replace it with this one. And now you'd find the determinant of that. So this is what you should have filled in here. What's the determinant of that going to be? So I'm going to actually probably expand along here. So that's plus one times. Block out everyone in that row, that column, you get one, four, two, nine. That becomes nine minus eight, so that's plus one. So that means, according to Kramer's rule, your z would actually be dz divided by d. So it's going to be 1 divided by minus 1. And so you would get z equals minus 1. And that was it. Well, the bonus we haven't gone to yet, so we'll, we'll explain that eventually. Eventually, you'll be able to understand, uh, answer the bonus. But that was a good review of how you find determinants. Basically, you're multiplying the components of a row or a column by the cofactors of that row or column. And you add them all up, and you get a determinant. And this is sort of assigned volume, assigned volume of the parallel of pipette formed by these three row vectors. So there's some sort of geometrical meaning to this. Um, but that was basically it. So the answer to the bonus is, um, basically I, I can just kind of say it, is that 
any system that has this guy as the coefficient matrix, meaning the D will be 1, you'll always be able to find a solution. In fact, it, it will always be a unique solution. Kramer's rule says that if your D is non-zero, be a unique solution. So your answer to how many solutions are there will be there's only one. It's a unique solution by Kramer's rule. Um, what is the reducer echelon form of that matrix? What would you guess it is? Of the coefficient matrix here, what would they... You would have to get the identity. Literally, if you have a unique solution, it has to get the identity. It means that if you reduce it, and on this side you have like whatever the 0, 4, and 9 become A, B, C, you'd have to have Z equals that, which now we know that the C is actually minus 1. Then you'll have Y equals this, then you'll have X equals that. Literally, the only way is to say x equals this, y equals this, z equals that, is to get the identity of this stuff. Um, if you didn't have the identity, you'll have infinite solutions. You wouldn't have a unique solution. And so you would either have no solution or Kramer's rule would fail and you'll have infinite. No, no, you'll be in the case of Kramer's rule where you get infinite solutions. By the way, so if we know that the determinant, I'll just mention this even though we haven't really covered it yet. So we found a, it's the same matrix, so we know that this is true. Who can guess what the determinant of this guy would be? You have a guess. Wouldn't A uh, transpose and A inverse, wouldn't they just cancel out? No. Transpose and inverse don't cancel. It's nine. How did you get 9? Do you know what the, the determinant of A transpose is? It's the same as the determinant of A. So that guy would give you... Um, the idea is the determinant of a product is going to be the product of determinants. Um, I'll probably get to prove that for you today. Um, so you can just actually just multiply these guys. And determinant of A inverse. So that determinant of A inverse, how does that relate to the determinant of A? It's 1 over the determinant of A, so it's the reciprocal of the determinant of A. And what is the determinant of A cubed? It's, it's, right, but it's literally going to be the determinant of A, and you can cube it. Right, and we'll talk about why that is. But again, it's because you can multiply out the products. What if I multiply by a 3? <laughs> How does that affect it? <laughs> 3 to the 3 would be what you have to multiply by. So, so this guy will just give you a negative 1 towards the answer. This guy would also contribute a negative 1 towards the answer because it's the same. This guy would also contribute a negative 1 towards the answer. This guy would contribute a 27. So overall, the answer was minus 27. Now, if you don't know that at this point, that's fine. I never actually covered how you would know that, but it's a bonus point for a reason. Right? So if you actually read ahead, you would know how to do that. And we're going to talk about that pretty much right now. So we'll continue our discussion of determinants. We're going to use row operations to figure out a determinant, but there are a bunch of things you need to know in order to do that. So we can recall some things that we spoke about last time. Um, if A has duplicate rows, and of course A is an n by n, right? Because it has to. Um, then determinant is zero. And again, you can do that by a two by two use induction to prove for larger cases. Um, this implies, by the way, that if um, 
A has rows that are multiples of each other. Alright, so if one row is a multiple of another row in the vector A, then it also means that determinant of A is zero. We also spoke about a theorem, which I don't remember if I called it a theorem or a lemma, but um, if you have a n by n, b n by n, and c n by n, such that all same except in row, in, except in one of these rows, I call it row i, and row i for c is just the sum of row i's for a and b. then it turns out that the determinant of C is equal to the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. It's kind of where we left off, and I kind of, I didn't prove this in general, but I illustrated to you the three by three case, in which case you can either use ellipses and just write down the general case, write it all out, or you can probably do something like induction. Um, but uh, the ellipses is fine. Okay. So, Turns out with that in mind, I will be able to talk about how one row operation affects the determinant. So we'll call this theorem one. Let A n by n be a matrix. If B is the matrix obtained by performing a type three row operation on A, then it turns out that the determinant of B will be exactly equal to the determinant of A. In other words, a type 3 row operation actually will not affect the determinant. So if I take a matrix and I do a type 3 row operation on that matrix, the determinant will not change. Type 3 row operations do not affect determinants. Right? Remember the type 3 operation was when you replace a row by itself plus a multiple of another row. That was what we called a type 3 row operation. Um, by the way, um, type 3, geometrically, this is what we call a shear. So it's like if you take a shape and then you kind of skew it. Right? It'll take up the same space, it just you kind of skew the shape. Right? So that's kind of why the volume. We'll understand that more in a later chapter. We'll talk about linear, uh, linear transformations in the plane and matrices, and we'll learn about shears and stuff like that. So type through your operation, geometrically what's happening is a shear. So it's kind of like you took a cube and you kind of pushed it so that it leaned like this, but it will hold the same amount of stuff in it. Um, so that is... Um, type through your operations don't affect the determinant. Um, so... Do a proof. So suppose A is A11 all the way up to A1n. Uh, Let this be the i row um, AI1, AI2, all the way up to AIN. <clears throat> and then it goes all the way down to the nth row, a n1, all the way down to a n n. And so let b be the matrix I do, I get by obtain, doing a type 3 row operation in this guy. So I just take a i1 plus a multiple of some other row. A uh, k 
KJ or whatever. All the way down to A I N plus a multiple of the other row. I'm just being I'm being sloppy with the notation. But everything else is the same. It turns out I will be able to write that guy as a sum of matrices. Where in this one, it's just the original matrix. AI1 all the way up to AIN, AN1 all the way up to ANN. And this one is just going to be all I don't want to add the matrices. I want to add their determinants. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so B is that matrix. It turns out. Well, well, can, hmm? Couldn't you say that the because the the one that's all zeros except for that one row has a determinant of zero, so it doesn't affect the determinant of the original matrix. I can't say. There's a reason why I can't say what I think you're saying. It's because. I, I couldn't do that because the determinant of A plus B in general is not the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. Oh, okay. It's not true in general. I can give you an example where that's not true, okay. which is why what I was doing, I, I can't actually do that. Um, but in the land of determinants, I can do that. Right. So B is going to be this matrix. So now let's talk about determinants. And, and I'll, I forgot to mention that earlier. So this, the, the determinant of a sum is not the sum of the determinants. That's not actually true. Um, it's not hard to do to actually show that, by the way. I will show it. So then this would mean that the determinant of B is equal to, and so this B is sort of going to be like C in the previous theorem. It's going to be the determinant of this guy plus the determinant of that guy. A1 blah blah blah. It's the problem with this thing, it's it's it gets annoying to write out all the ellipses all the time. This will be different in that row. So if I translate to determinants, uh, let, let me write out what B was. So you can kind of see it. So the determinant of A11, da da da, A1n, this would be A I1 plus the R A blah blah blah. This would be A I N plus the R A blah blah blah. A N1, da da da, A N N. So this, in the previous theorem, this is like your C, this is like the A, this is like the B. So I have three matrices where they're all the same except for this one row, right? So this row is just the normal AI1 all the way down to AIN. They're all the same except in this one row, I change this row and this row are different. And over here, this row is the sum of those two rows, right? So it's like in the previous theorem, this would be true by the previous theorem. But, 
So this is from the previous theory. But the determinant of that last guy is zero. The determinant of the guy with the, with the multiple of one row times the other is zero. And so you have the determinant of this one would equal to the determinant of the original. I should have labeled this. I should probably call this guy C. <laughs> That's going to be confusing. But my B here is like the C in the, in the previous there. So the idea is the determinant of something that looks like this is the determinant of things that add up and look like that. The determinant of this guy is going to be zero, so it ends up with the determinant of this guy is exactly the same as the determinant of that guy. So it's exactly the same whether I did a type 3 operation to the row or not. I just kind of got lazy writing down all these subscripts. It's been a long day. I'm not in the mood for writing down all these subscripts. Um, warning. The determinant of A plus B is not equal to the determinant of A plus the determinant of B in general. Um, how can you actually see that? Well, let's just make up an example. I, I don't think it's hard to find an example, so I'm pretty sure I can just make up a random example that's going to work. Let's try. Let A be something like 1, 2, 3, 4. So we know that the determinant of A is what? Huh? Minus 2. Let B actually be the negative of this guy. Or something else. Would it work with a negative? I'm not. So minus one, minus it probably. I mean, it shouldn't be hard to find an example. <laughs> I wrote one down, but I can't bother walking all the way over there. Okay, so the determinant of B would be what? Negative. It'll be exactly the same because negative times negative becomes positive anyway, um, and so it's also negative two. But what is the determinant of A plus B? A plus B is literally the zero, it's the determinant of zero, 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 right? Because I add those two. So that would give me zero. While if I do the determinant of A plus the determinant of B, I get negative four, which is obviously not the same. So it's easy to prove that using a counterexample. Some things happen so rarely, you can just make up a random example. <laughs> It'll happen to work. Right, you, have to, you have to try really hard to get that to work. So it's not true in general. So that's why I couldn't sort of break up the matrix, the matrix before without putting the determinants on these. Um, and so that's the, the, the reasoning for the weird statement of, of that last theorem. It's because I couldn't use this fact, I had to use some other fact. So that's one theorem. So type 3 operations do not affect the determinant. Right, so if I have a matrix and I do a type 3 operation on that matrix, in turn, the matrix will change, but the determinant won't. Um, let's do another thing, theorem 2. Which one did I want to do? I'm going to tell you how all three... Uh, <coughs> all three affected. Okay, so the second one I want to do is the scaling. Uh, so let A, N by N be a matrix. If B is obtained
by multiplying a row of A by K. This means, by the way, this is called a type 2 operation. Then the determinant of B is equal to, what do you think? It's the scalar multiple of the determinant of A. Right. The proof for that is not hard. Just expand along the row that you expand along the row that was multiplied. And you'll be able to factor out a K. So that's using the, the fact that the determinant of A, I can just pick a row. Let's say I pick the row AI1, CI1, that was scaled by the K. All of these elements then, AIN, CIN, would have the Ks in front, so I can factor the K out. AI1, CI1, plus da 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 da, AIN, CIN. And that just... This is just by definition the, defi the determinant of A. So that's just K times the determinant of A. So if I multiply a row by a scalar, the determinant itself gets multiplied by a scalar. So if I have a matrix and I do a type 2 row operation on it, I multiply a single row, multiply A row, just one of them, by a scalar, the determinant will be multiplied by that scalar. Yes. Can you do an example on the Example. Let's take the same matrix from the quiz. So we know what that determinant is already. So it's, it was 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, minus 2, 2, minus 2. So we know that the determinant of A is equal to this. We, we got that that was minus 1 before. So suppose we multiply row 1 by 2. And it doesn't matter which row I multiply by 2, by the way. Um, so then I would want to find the determinant of this guy. It turns out the answer is just going to be 2 times minus 1. And the reason is, again, I could expand along this row, and the only thing that would happen is I would have that 2 times the 1 plus the cofactor plus that 2 times the 1 plus that cofactor, and I'd be able to factor that 2 on the outside. And literally everything that I did before would stay the same inside the parentheses. So type 3 operations do not change your determinant. Type 2 operations scale the determinant. There's one more row operation. That's the one of switching rows. Theorem 3. A is an n by n matrix. B is do I want to um, write a note somewhere because you, you like you should always have like these cast, catchphrases for truths you know I E type two operations scale the determinant right by whatever scalar multiple you multiply a robot. If B is obtained by switching two rows, that is a type one operation. Then the determinant of B 
It turns out it will be the negative of the determinant of eight. That sort of has to do with orientation. So it's like when you swap two rows, it's the same as you swapping two vectors, and it kind of changes the orientation of things in some sense. Probably something else you'll understand more fully when we talk about transformations in the plane. But the proof for this is actually um, IE, type 1 operations negate the determinant. Um, proof for this is usually given in a sentence, um, but I'll, I'll probably just illustrate it for you. Um, It turns out that switching two rows can be described as doing the following. Performing a sequence of type 3 operations then multiplying a row by minus 1. So it turns out doing a bunch of type 3 operations is not going to change your determinant. The moment, moment you multiply a row by minus 1, you automatically scale the determinant by minus 1. Um, that might not be clear why this is the case, but I'll, I'll give you the specific algorithm of how you can switch two rows of a matrix using type 2 and type 3 row operations. Well, a bunch of type 3 followed by a type um, let's illustrate with a two by two. So I'm gonna we're gonna literally switch two rows of this guy. So here I have A, B, C, D. How would I be able to swap two rows A, B, C? How can I describe that mathematically? Well, let's do one thing. I'm going to add row one and row two. So I have A plus C, B plus D, C, D. Notice, by the way, that the determinant of this is going to be equal to the determinant of that because adding two rows is a type 3 operation. Here's what I'm going to do next. This is A plus C, B plus D. I'm going to take um, row 2 and minus row 1. Again, that's a type 3 operation, so the determinant of this is actually going to be equal to the determinant of that. So I take C minus this, I just get a minus A. D minus this, I just get a minus B. I'm going to do another type 3 operation. Now I'm going to add the new row 1s and row 2s. This plus this gives me C. This plus this gives me D. And then finally, I'm going to take row 2 and multiply by minus 1. So that just becomes a positive A and a B. The top would be a C and a D. And this will negate your determinant. Right? So literally swapping two rows is the same as going through the algorithms. I can describe that by going through a bunch of type 3s and then finishing it off by a type 2. None of these change the determinant. That one multiplies the determinant by a minus one. So overall, swapping two rows negates the determinant. Why do we care about all this? Well, last time we kind of ended class on a note that determinants can be sort of complicated in general. Um, not necessarily the ones we're doing in class, but probably the ones you'll be dealing with in practice, like if you're actually using determinants to do something. The matrices might be huge, and finding a determinant is sort of a computational challenge, believe it or not. The matrices can get huge enough. So whenever you can actually do something to reduce the number of computations you have, you should. So the idea is, knowing exactly how row operations affect the determinant means 
that if I want to find a determinant of a matrix, I can do a bunch of row operations on that matrix and just keep track of the row operations, and then I'll know how to change the determinant at the end of the day. So the idea is, given a matrix that's not in a nice form, do a bunch of row operations to get it into a nice form, find the determinant of that, but then you just keep track of your row operations and then you can alter that determinant. So you can figure out the determinant of the original by knowing about the determinant of the, the, the end matrix. So that's why we're here. We can use row operations. to put matrices in nice forms. By the way, a nice form for a matrix to be to take a determinant is to have lots of zeros, so you don't have to actually find a lot of the cofactors. Like reduced echelon form? I'm thinking more like triangular form. Remember if you get a bunch of zeros, you can just multiply along the diagonal. So the solving a determinant kind of becomes a multiplication problem where it's a computer doing that is not a big deal. But finding a bunch of cofactors is a big deal. Um, a nice form for determinants. This changes the determinant. In predictable ways. So we can figure out the determinant of the original. Um, a process that we do this by is called pivotal condensation. get a matrix that's not in a nice form and you want to put it in a nice form. So this is kind of like if I ask you like a huge determinant and there are no zeros in it, you can create your own zeros. That's the nice thing. I can use a row operation and create zeros and find my determinant easier. So um, one thing I would, I will say here, because you don't really want to lose track of things. So by hand, think mostly if not exclusively. I'd say exclusively, but I don't want to be a tyrant or a dictator. To type three operations. Right, because then you will you you kind of don't have to keep track of what you're doing if you're doing a type three operation as far as determinants are concerned, because you're not changing the answer. Um, so let's actually do an example. Yeah. Is there any advantage to doing type There's an advantage to doing a type three. There's not necessarily an advantage to do a type one or type two. If you do a type one, you have to remember you, you get the negative of the original answer. So if you do a type 1 and you find the determinant, you have to remember, oh, the determinant of the original has to be the negative of whatever answer I just got. Right? If you do a type 2, and so whatever answer you got, you have to remember that the determinant of the original is actually the scale that you just multiplied by. You have to divide by that scale to get the negative of the original. Right? So if, to get it into a nice form, I have to multiply a row by 5. It means that the original determinant will be 1 -fifth of whatever determinant I get now. So you have to keep track of the row operations. However, if you're, if you're doing a type 3, you don't. You can do as many type 3s as you want, you're not going to change the determinant. So there's an advantage to doing a type 3 as opposed to a type 1 or a type 2. Uh, find the determinant of 1 minus 2, 3, 2 minus 1, 
It's 1 minus 3, 1, 4. Notice that that guy has no zeros. So you can actually just bite the bullet and decide to expand it on a row, but you probably wouldn't even want to do that if I gave you like a 4 by 4, so forget that. Um, but I'm illustrating with a 3 by 3. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to create zeros somewhere. So now, essentially, you can kind of pick anywhere you want to create the zeros. Um, so the idea is, I'm going to pick a row or a column. I'm going to choose someone in that row to be my pivot. Not in the, the just pivot in the sense that it's the only non-zero number in that row or column. And I'm going to do row operations to get zeros everywhere else in that row or column. Is the idea. So you can pick anyone. Who, who you want to pick? Hmm? So let's say I pick this guy, arbitrary. That's my pivot. And I'm going to want to expand along this column. I choose that I want to expand along my second column. And I'm going to leave that guy non-zero. Now I'm going to perform row operations to make this a zero and that a zero. So now that when I expand along that column, I only need to really do one cofactor. So how would I do that? Well, this is equal to, I can replace this row by adding that row, right? And what kind of operation is that? It's so a type three. It's literally not going to change the determinant for me to do that. So everything else stay the same. This stay the same. Here I'm going to take row two itself plus a multiple of another row. That's how a type three is framed. So I'm going to replace row two by itself plus one times row three. And so it's just me adding these two guys. That's a minus one. That's a zero. And that's a three. So I've created a zero there. Right? Now the matrix is different, but the solution to the system that it would solve would not be different, as well as the determinant of the matrix would not be different, because I just did type 3. Now what? I can do the same thing in the first row. In fact, I'm going to want to stick to a type 3 here, because I can actually get away with that pretty easy. If I take row 1 and add it to 2 times row 3, right? that's a type 3 operation. It's not going to affect my determinant. So I multiply this by 2 and add it to that. So that's uh, minus 6 plus 1 minus 5, 2 minus 2, 0, 8 plus 3, <coughs> 11. So now I've created zeros where there was none. Right? And in terms of determinants, I did not change the answer because I, I did a type threes. So this is a type three operation that I did here. Type three operation that I did here. So now I can actually expand along this guy. And so I'm going to do that plus, minus, plus, minus. So I know that this becomes minus one times block out that row and that column, I would get minus 5, 11, minus 3, 4. None of the other guys matter. Is it minus 1, 3? 3, right here, right? And minus 1 on the second. Oh, yeah, I, I looked at the last row. I should be looking here. That's minus 1 and 3. Okay, so this is job now minus 1, this times this is minus 15, minus, which that becomes plus, that becomes an 11, and so that becomes what? Positive 4. So I do a couple of type 3's, which is just really addition. Um, Do two type threes and then I can do one cofactor. That beats doing three cofactors.
So that, that what I just did was called pivotal condensation. fact that you can use, that you could have used in, in one of the bonus problems, um, the determinant of k times a is equal to k to the n times the determinant of a, right, where a is an n by n matrix. So what, what, what basically happens here is that to find Ka, we perform a type 2 in every row. Right? So we multiply. by k n times. So to find k times a, you're literally multiplying every row by k. Every time you do that, you multiply the determinant by a k. This happens for every row, so you end up multiplying by k n times. And so the determinant of a constant times a matrix is just the constant raised to the number of rows times the determinant of the matrix. That's one fact that can help us. Again, this is just to provide a shortcut for finding a determinant. Another fact, kind of a theorem, but I, I won't really prove it at this point. The determinant of A times B is, turns out, the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Kind of just write it out. Write out the cofactor def definition of the determinants on both sides. You'll have to like expand the parentheses and regroup and that kind of thing. So a direct computational proof can work here, um, but that's an important fact as well. Um, this also means another important fact: the determinant of a matrix raised to a power is just the determinant of that matrix raised to that power. Because this guy is just the determinant of A times A dot product multiplied by A K times. So then you just get the determinant of A times the determinant of A times the determinant of A K times. So you can get the determinant of A raised to the K. Proof. Uh, use previous fact with induction. So if it works for two guys, it will work for a multiple of people. That would be a nice technique. Now I'm going to prove something later. I use the same technique, so I don't have to prove that now. Um, try this. It's probably a nice quiz question or a test question. Assume this. Prove that. Sorry. 
It's actually not that bad to, to check how well you are with induction. Yeah. So, so try that. It's simple enough for me to ask on a quiz, so it's probably something you should know how to do. So test out your induction skills. What other facts do you have? Okay, there's another theorem here. So once we kind of defined everything, a lot of things just kind of fall into our laps for free, almost. If not for free, by straightforward calculations. Um, so your book calls this a theorem, um, but it says that... Oh, the transpose. A is an n by n matrix. It turns out that the determinant of the transpose is actually the determinant of the original. So taking a transpose also does not change the determinant. Um, the proof for that is, is actually not so bad. Um, expanding, if you're doing a Laplace expansion, then expanding along the ith row of A is exactly the same. as expanding along the i-th column of A transpose. Like exactly, you get literally the same numbers, right? Because in the transpose, all your rows become columns. So literally anything that was for the columns before is now true for the rows. And so expanding along the rows of this, this guy, the same as expanding along the column of that guy, you'll get all the same numbers because everyone will be in the same relative position. It's kind of like you tilt your head like this and you do the expansion, right? All the numbers are going to be the same. So that's actually not so bad either. Okay, A lot of things that's going on in the background here, I'm using that cofactor expansion definition of a determinant. It's just the elements of a row times all their cofactors. But the elements of the rows here is just the elements of the columns here. So we have that fact. The other facts I want to tell you about involve inverses. So we probably should talk about what inverses are. Other important facts will involve inverses. B, I get the identity matrix. And if I get B times A, I will also get the identity matrix. It's a matrix that if I multiply A by on either side, I get the identity matrix for the identity matrix for the matrices. So that's in this case. We call B the inverse of A. Or colloquially, we'll just say A inverse. Okay. 
and right. B equals A to the minus 1. So this is the notation. So a, a to the minus 1, i.e., a to the minus 1 means the inverse of a. It does not mean, for example, 1 over a. In fact, this actually makes no sense in, in matrices. Um, division doesn't exist. Look at all the properties of division on the real number. There is no such operation in matrices that will fulfill all the properties. Uh, we'll prove this later, but it's useful to know. I'll probably ask you to prove it later. Once we, we learn a bunch of things, um, It turns out that both of these equations will be true at the same time. So if it's actually true that a times b is equal to i, it will automatically be true that b times a is equal to i. So while both of these exist in the definition, really you only kind of have to verify one of them. So if you ever want to check that something is an inverse of, of something else, you can multiply in either order uh, and it will work. This means that a times b equals i if and only if b times a equals i. So you only need to check one of the equations, right? If one holds, the other one will pull. Uh, this also means if B is the inverse of A, then it's true to say, it's just as equally to true to say, then A is the inverse of B. So in the land of matrices, once you find an inverse in one direction, you find an inverse in both directions. What other quick facts can I tell you about? find some more terms. I don't think I have time for those, those proofs. Definition. It's a pretty much, it's, this is a vocabulary definition. There's, there's no real mathematical content to it. If a is invertible, it is called non-singular. So if you say this is a non-singular matrix, it means it's invertible. It'll, it'll also tell you something about the determinant. Um, spoiler alert, uh, the determinant of an invertible matrix is always non-zero. And in fact, if you know the determinant of a matrix is non-zero, it means it's invertible. It's, it's one of those equivalent definitions. Um, so uh, if A is not invertible, I know it's kind of the opposite, but it's just it's what we call it, is not invertible, i.e. if its determinant is zero, then it is called Singular. Right. 
So there's no other matrix that I can multiply A by to get the identity. So in that sense, it's a little bit simple. I don't know if that's the if that was the logic for the name, but. We're kind of out of time. Uh, so next time I'll prove a bunch of things. We'll be able to talk a lot about I in, in the inverse matrices by talking about elementary matrices. So we'll define that next time. And we'll prove a bunch of stuff from that. And then we'll be able to wrap up chapter one pretty quickly after that. So I'm thinking our test would be right before we leave for spring break, which is the 29th, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I feel like by the 29th, I should have covered everything by a week before then, I think. Or maybe even two weeks before. So we'll set the first test for the 29th. And from there. Yeah.